Namaste and a warm welcome to all of our friends who have joined us this evening. Today, we are in the 14th day of the Global Festival of Yoga, which started on the International Yoga Day, that is 21st June 2020, and then continuing up to 20th July 2020. And each day we are having three sessions, one in the morning, one in the noon and one in the evening. And this afternoon, we had a wonderful session on Nada Yoga Upasana by Dr. Deepak Paramashivan. Continuing the, so, that same thread of sadhana we have with us for this evening, a wonderful senior sadhaka with us, Dr. Stephen Parker. I now request Stephen Ji to join us. It is a pleasure to 
have Dr. Stephen Parker, Anthony Parker, Stoma Ji, as he is known by his Diksha name, joining us for this session. I welcome him. Namaste, Stoma Ji. Namaste, Vinaya. It's Namaste. lovely to have you. Yeah. So, and I also welcome all our participants who have joined us this evening. I'll give a very brief introduction to Stoma Ji and you will know much more about him as and when he addresses you shortly. Dr. Stephen Parker is a doctor, a psychologist, a psychotherapist by profession, and he's also a senior faculty member of AHIMSIN, that is an acronym for the Association of Himalayan Yoga Meditation Societies International. Just see the acronym is so beautiful. Ahimsin. This is a Sanskrit word for one who is established in Ahimsa. Ahimsa asti asmin iti Ahimsin. A beautiful word connecting back to one of the uh, Yamas in the Yoga Sutra. It says Ahimsa Pratishthayam Tat Sannidhav Vairatyagaha. So a natural enmity, even the natural enmity is cast away in the presence of a person in whom Ahimsa is fully established. And I think this very aptly uh, reflects in Stoma Ji's uh, nature, in his reflection. This is the first time I'm meeting him, have just connected him over Facebook and other places. And yet the love he has showered and uh, the welcoming nature of his being, I think that's been something that is highly encouraging for all of us. So thank you Stoma Ji for that. Continuing further, uh, Stephen Parker of Stomaji was initiated in the Himalayan yoga tradition by Swami Veda Bharati and was given the initiate name Stoma. Stoma has several meanings in Sanskrit, but one of the meanings is something, a word of praise. You want to add something here, Stomaji? No, that's, that's accurate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And... Uh, Swami Veda Bharati comes from the Himalayan yoga tradition that a school or uh, an approach that was started by none other than Swami Rama. And I must share it here. I'm compelled to share it at this moment. My first exposure to the world of yoga and spirituality was through Swami Rama's very, very popular book, Living with Himalayan Masters. In my high school, uh, my Sanskrit teacher, who will be also presenting tomorrow morning, he just introduced this book and said, none of you should read this at this age. I think that was the way of him <laughs> inspiring us to read. <laughs> so he told none of you should read it at this age. And in the next three days, I had read that book. So and that was my very first exposure to this entire world of the inner world and the mystical world and the magic world. So, and ever since I have enjoyed this journey. So continuing further, Stoma Ji, among the first teachers certified by the Himalayan International Teachers Association, again, the acronym is beautiful. It becomes Hita. Hita, Ahimsa, they go together. He began teaching Hatha Yoga in the year 1974. Stoma Ji is an experienced registered yoga teacher. This is a particular designation in the Yoga Alliance tradition. Uh, ERYT they call it, at the 500 hour level of the Yoga Alliance. A meditation, a member of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, he serves on the faculties of the Meditation Center in Minneapolis and the Sadhana Mandir and Sadhaka Gram Ashrams in Rishikesh, India. He is also a senior faculty member of the Himalayan Yoga Traditions Teachers Training Program. He has lectured on yoga, meditation and spiritual practice in the US and Canada, as well as in the Caribbean countries, Holland, Italy, Austria, Hungary, South Africa, Korea, Hong Kong, and India. The list is long, I'll stop it here. In 2004, I think this is a very interesting and uh, something that we really need to seek to in the future. In 2004, he helped originate and teach the first course on yoga in an American medical school at the University of Minnesota Academic Medical Center. The approach to integral medicine will be the way of the future. And I think the step that Stomaji has taken something highly contributive towards this effect. In 2007, he received preliminary vows of renunciation from Swami Veda and the Shankaracharya of Karavira Pitha. Stomaji has been a licensed psychologist in private practice in St. Paul, Minneapolis since 1985. 
He also serves as adjunct assistant school professor of counseling and psychological services at St. Mary's University of Minnesota and adjunct assistant professor in the graduate school of professional psychology at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. He teaches on the faculty of the introductory workshops of the Minnesota Society of Clinical Hypnosis. In addition to authoring journal articles and book chapters, Dr. Parker Stomaji edited volumes of Swami Veda's definitive scholarly work on Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and he has been a peer review editor for the Journal of Men's Studies, the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry, and the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. With all this, he is yet very humble and highly accessible and reachable. So this has taken us to him, close to him, and he has agreed to be with us this evening. And I now request Stomaji to take over from this point. Thank you, Stomaji, for being here. Most welcome. Well, that was quite a, quite a detailed introduction. Uh, I can remember one time when my mentor, Swami Veda, was introducing the great Kashmir Shaiva scholar, Bettina Boimer from Austria. He had wanted to meet Dr. Boimer for many, many years and finally had the opportunity. And uh, he asked me to give a brief introduction based on her resume and uh, I gave a brief five minute introduction. He proceeded to expand that to 40 minutes of elaborating in great detail on her wonderful career as a scholar and as a practitioner and a disciple of the Kashmir Shaiva tradition. And then he turned over the floor to uh, Sharada and she just sat quietly, looked out at the audience for some time because I'm sure the introduction was a bit embarrassing. And she just said to everybody, our only qualification is our master. And this is, this is our attitude in yoga. And so I would say the same thing, our only qualification is our master. And I'd like to begin with our subject for today, becoming an advanced beginner with a story from my own master, Swami Rama of the Himalayas. Swamiji had a disciple in Europe who had received a question from a student in the form of a letter. And he had some questions about how to respond to the student. And so he made an appointment with Swami Rama to talk over the situation. And he arrived at Swami Rama's apartment at the appointed time, but he realized as he sat down that he had forgotten to bring a letter with him. So Swamiji came out to greet him and my friend got up to uh, and excused himself to go and get the letter. And Swamiji said, no, 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 wait, just sit, put out your hands, look up. So he put out his hands, he looked up. And all of a sudden a piece of paper comes floating out of the air into Wolfgang's hand. And he looked at the paper and Swamiji asked, is this the letter that you were looking for? And Wolfgang said, yes, Swamiji, can you teach me how to do that? And Swamiji chuckled at him and he said, Sonny, just refine your breath awareness. All of this will come to you. I want you to remember this sutra take it with you in your sadhana because the secret of advanced practice in yoga is the ultimate refinement of the fundamentals of yoga we have an idea i think based on a lot of contemporary misunderstandings of the yoga path that we advance in the, in the path of sadhana by learning a lot of advanced techniques, by learning a lot of complicated procedures. And the truth is actually exactly the opposite. The real gold in the path of yoga comes through the ultimate refinement of the most fundamental practices. 
And the most fundamental practice there is in yoga is breath awareness. It's the foundation of all systems of meditation and the cultivation of mindful awareness, of maintaining your awareness in buddhi from moment to moment, not only when you do your practice, but also through the rest of the day, is the fundamental practice of yoga. We say yoga is union. Well, joining what to what? And the answer to the question is joining mindful awareness to everything in your life. Joining mindful awareness to everything in your life. If you live your life as a mindfully aware person, your sadhana will flourish, no matter what other things you're doing. This is really important. And this is the most fundamental practice in yoga. Whenever we make an effort to do something in yoga, we create an obstacle for ourselves. Why? Because in order to make an effort, you have to stimulate the stress systems in your brain and nervous system. And of course, we have to make some efforts in the beginning of learning new practices, of course. We learn a new posture. It takes some conscious effort to learn the alignment of the posture and to learn how it fits in your own body. But gradually, in the process of refining the practice of that posture, you let go of all the effort. I think we all know uh, the first sutra on asana in chapter in the sadhana pada of the yoga sutras 46 sthira sukham asanam the posture should be steady and comfortable yes and most of the time when we're teaching hatha yoga most teachers will say get into the posture then relax all the unnecessary tension in your body and most of the time that's as far as they go the second sutra in on asana, Sutra 47, recommends two additional refinements once you have the basic posture. Prayatna shaitilya, the relaxation of all effort, all effort, and anantya samapati. This prayatna shaitilya means not only relaxing the unnecessary tension in a posture, also the necessary tension. So you might ask, how do you hold the posture? You don't hold the posture, ultimately. Prana holds the posture. That may sound like a radical proposition, but a real yogi has no tension in their body at any time. They live in a corpse that remains a corpse. How do I know this? Well, we actually measured this in Swami Veda. This is one of the things we discovered accidentally about uh, Swami Veda over some time. He was giving a lecture one time in our teacher training program on the subject of biofeedback. And so we had him hooked up to a machine called an electromyogram that measures muscle tension. It measures the differences in uh, the conductance of electricity across your skin based on whether you are making an effort or not. And as he was lecturing, he was walking around the room, writing on the board. Um, and one of our faculty members who happened to be a physician was watching the instrument and he started laughing. And after a while, Swamiji said, what's so funny? And the fellow watching the machine said, Swamiji, this is not possible. You're moving around the room, walking and writing, and the machine says, zero. These are the readings we get from a corpse, he said. This is the perfection of Shavasana. The perfection of Shavasana doesn't come lying on the floor. The perfection of Shavasana comes when you can keep that same degree of relaxation as you walk through your life. And if you can maintain 
that kind of relaxation in your physical life, your body will go a long way towards healing itself. Swami Veda needed to have that healing effect. He had a body that happened to be quite physically ill. He had uh, very serious type one diabetes. He had cardiovascular disease uh, that required a bypass operation in 1992. And at one point, sometime in the early 2000s, he told me, you know, Stoma, I have never, I have never been without cardiac heart pain for one second waking or sleeping since that operation. He was never without angina. And yet, we never saw him suffer. He was an incredibly joyful person as he gave his lectures. You know, I travel at this point in my life about 80,000 miles a year teaching for our tradition. And he traveled almost twice that much. <laughs> his doctors in 1992 told him, if you ever go up in an airplane again, you will die because your heart can't carry enough oxygen. Well, he would fly around the world twice a year for the next 10 or 20 years. How could he do that? By maintaining that moment to moment relaxation. And that requires keeping an awareness of the sensation of breath in your nostrils all the time and at a very deep level. So it's that kind of ultimate refinement and ability to let go that helps the body to thrive in the process of asana. So that's prayatna shaitilya. How about anantya samapati? Coalescence of the mind with infinity. Now, that's kind of a nebulous term and it suggests a process of meditation. And certainly, in the depth of a, of a practice of a posture, you do go into meditation. It actually has a specific technical meaning in the practice of Hatha Yoga. And that technical meaning is that you learn first to feel the space inside the body. We often begin our process of meditation by saying, feel the space your body occupies. And that's also the fundamental uh, position of mindfulness in the practice of asana. You feel the space your body occupies from head to toe. And as you go more and more deeply into the experience of that sense of spaciousness, at some point, you identify the space in the body, the space in the little jar, in which we live our lives with all of space, with the entire Akasha Tattva. And when that happens, you lose your personal identification with the physical body. This is how the Hatha Yogis do that. It's a meditative process of dissolving the sense of personal space into all of space in these meditative processes of going deeply into the experience of asana. So I think for many people, that will give you some extra territory to explore in your asana practice. Same thing even for the process of observing the breath in meditation. It's a very interesting sutra in the Samadhi Pada, Sutra 34. Prachardana vitarnabhyam Va pranasya. This sutra falls in a series of techniques that practices that Patanjali is suggesting for going into samadhi. Because the word prana appears here, many people, including most of the commentators on the major commentators on the Yoga Sutras, assume that Patanjali is talking about pranayama and that this. Uh, sutra is suggesting some particular form of pranayama. And that's not the case. That's not what the sutra means at all. One of the rules, I mean, if you look at the Yoga Sutras, he deals with pranayama in the Sadhana Pada, uh, chapter two. Um, and so there's no need to discuss it in chapter one. In the, in the Yoga Sutras, 
one of the rules of sutra literature is that you, you don't repeat yourself for the sake of brevity. Um, another rule is that you use, you don't use synonyms. If you, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between words and concepts. So if Patanjali uses a different word for something, he means a different concept. And he doesn't use the ordinary words for exhalation and inhalation, either ordinary respiration or the terms puraka and rechaka that we use for pranayama. He uses prachardana and vidharana, which are both words that indicate a very careful, close meditative observation of the flow of breath. So the practice that's being recommended here is simply observing the flow of breath in your nostrils in exactly the same way as it's taught in the Buddhist traditions of meditation. The practice of Vanapanasati in the, the Pali traditions of Theravada Buddhism is basically prana upana anusmriti in the yoga tradition. And Vyasa, Vyasa discusses this under those terms in several places in his commentary. So whenever I want to see whether an author really understands the practical side of the Yoga Sutras, I look at how they interpret Sutra 34 of chapter one. And if they get this point about breath awareness, then I know they have some experience and they understand something. Um, so once again, it's a matter of refining, the ultimate refinement of breath awareness. Um, a few months ago, I was finishing a course that I was teaching on some texts in Kashmir Shaiva philosophy. We were looking at Vijnana Bhairava, which is a text which is very similar to the Vibhutipada, the third chapter of the Yoga Sutras. It's a catalog of concentrations that help to bring the mind to samadhi. Some of them are very ordinary. Concentrating on a sneeze concentrating on the taste of your food, on remembering an experience of making love. All of these are things that provide us with a gateway to samadhi. And as you read this text, you begin to wonder, you know, when I taste my food every day, that doesn't happen to me. How, how does the mind prepare itself to be in a position to be able to, to have that experience from um, to have the experience of samadhi from this sensory experience? And the answer is in the gradual refinement of your awareness of that experience. And this falls into uh, the domain of the practices of tapas. Most of the time when we think of tapas, we kind of go, oh, don't like that. You know, our, because our idea of tapas is that it's self-denial. That's not really what tapas is about. In fact, if all you do in your tapas is deny yourself, sooner or later, you're going to have a binge. If you try to fast by just not eating food, somewhere out there in your future is a couple of liters of ice cream. I guarantee you. Um, the real secret to tapas is enjoyment through concentration. That's a really interesting concept. I sat down with Swami Veda one time and uh, his blood sugar was dropping and we needed to find him some orange juice. And so we got him the orange juice and we were sitting across the table from each other and he looked at me in this particular way. He looked at me when he was teaching something and he said, Stoma, have you ever taken a sip of orange juice to go into samadhi? And he took a sip of orange juice and off he went. And he stayed in that ecstasy for four or five minutes. And when he opened his eyes, he said, nobody knows how to taste. That's the kind of thing he was referring to. Um, I had... Uh, Something happened one time uh, with some students of mine in Eastern Europe, in Hungary. <clears throat> I had been invited to a dinner party and my host had made a lovely uh, chocolate torte with uh, caramelized pears. And 
people who know me know that at home I'm an amateur chef, so I have a, I'm kind of a foodie. So one of the guests at the party was the owner of one of the uh, best vineyards in Hungary. And he brought a sample of their product with him. Uh, and this table wine had some Merlot in it. And as a chef, I know Merlot and chocolate are friends. So I said to myself, let me taste just a little bit of this wine with the food and see how it matches up. So I took a tablespoon of the wine with my cake. And as those flavors combined on my palate, all of a the sudden, there was a burst of energy up my spine. It straightened my body. Every hair on my body stood up because it wasn't a good match of food and wine. It was a perfect match of food and wine. And this is an example of a principle that was first described by the great yogi and philosopher Abhinava Gupta, possibly the greatest philosopher who ever lived in any tradition, um, the great aesthetician of India. And he first made the argument that experiences of aesthetic rapture, experiences of being overwhelmed by the beauty of something can propel your mind into samadhi even for a few seconds. And that's really what tapas is about. It's about living your life this way with such mindfulness and such attention to what you're doing, to what you're experiencing in life, that you actually taste your life much more deeply than other people. And gradually, as you refine that awareness and intensify it, you reach a place where your process of fasting, for example, becomes an experience of replacing the pleasure of filling your body with food, satisfying that, that primary desire we have, replacing that with an experience of joy that comes from the beauty, the aesthetic rapture of the beauty of that food. Now, the problem we have with our primary desires is that when we try to satisfy them with their objects, it doesn't work. You know, we get hungry again in five hours. And so we have to keep eating over and over and over. But when you satisfy your mind with an experience of joy, then the primary desire gradually reduces over time. And this is how you gradually reduce your dependence on the things you desire. You know, not by denying yourself, that doesn't work. But by enjoying these things with concentration, with enough concentration, that it becomes an exercise in an experience of beauty rather than an experience of pleasure. And this is really the secret of Sri Vidya in the Tantra system. You know, the Tantra system can be very intellectual and very complicated. If you read all the texts, you know, and you read all the meditation manuals, it's, it's all, there's all kinds of technique in there. But this is what you're really doing. All of that technique is about refining your awareness to the point where you can experience that beauty in everything you taste, everything you touch, everything you smell. And each of those experiences can be a springboard to samadhi, can be a door through which you open into the glory of divinity all around you. And then you become Brahmacharya. Then you walk in the world with an awareness of Brahman. Then, as Jesus says, you see the kingdom all around you. You know, Jesus didn't talk about heaven. That, that all came later, that was other people's ideas. Jesus said to his disciples several times in the New Testament, in the Christian Bible, the kingdom is all around you and you don't see it. It was the same message that Buddha gave, the same message that the yogis give over and over and over. Wake up, be aware, taste your life. And the wonderful thing is, if you really do that and you live your life that way, and you do your practice that way, 
then what's going to happen over time is that your mind is gradually going to be filled with more and more joy. The path of tapas is the path of going from one joy to a greater joy. And eventually it brings to maturity in your personality these qualities that are referred to by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras as Brahma Viharas, Maitri, friendliness, Karna, compassion, Mudita, joy-mindedness, and Upeksha, non-reactivity. It makes your mind feel clear and pure and steady. And that's what you need in order to be able to go into Samadhi. We all need to stabilize our mind field. We all need to cleanse our mind field of the disturbances that come from emotional conflicts. You know, you watch your breath, those pauses and hitches and little disturbances in the flow of the breath that you feel are all the physical reputation, representations of emotional conflicts that you carry in your mind. The, the deeper you go into your breath awareness, the more you allow your breath to become smooth and long and deep, the more your mind will also begin to fill with this sense of joyfulness and this enhanced ability to really taste your life. So let's just take a few minutes here to do a little bit of practice. So just wherever you're sitting, first thing, no need to do anything special. Just feel the space your body occupies inside. You can let your eyes gently close if you like. And feel that space. And at the same time, bring your mind back from all other time. Back from the past and memory back from anticipating the future. Just feel the flow and the touch of your breath here and now. No need to do, just observe. As you watch, Notice how your breath is already correcting itself. Is already becoming longer, deeper, smoother. And let those natural changes continue. Just feel, feel the breath as if the whole body is breathing. Wave of breath and prana, gently washing you with the exhaling breath. Gently energizing you with the inhaling breath. And let that gentle current help you release any tension in your muscles. Feel inside muscles in the top of your head and your forehead. Feel inside the tightness gently and lovingly till the muscles just let go. Feel down around your eyes and eyebrows.
your forehead and the top of your head. Feel inside your cheeks and the corners of your mouth. Release the corners of your jaw. Muscles in your neck. Feel down inside your throat center. Down into your shoulders. Your upper arms. Your forearms. your hands, fingers, and fingertips. For a moment, feel as if the breath is flowing between the crown of your head and your fingertips. Relax your fingertips, feel back inside your fingers. Let your fingers go as if they could just float away. Feel back inside your hands and let your hands go. Feel back into your forearms. Your upper arms. And your shoulders. Relax your throat center. Feel down inside your chest. Relax your upper chest and upper back. Let go of your rib cage. Relax your heart center in the center of your chest. Exhaling and inhaling this space, free and deep. Relax your navel. Feel down inside your hip joints. <clears throat> Feel your spine balanced on your sit bones. Feel down inside your thighs, let them go. Relax your calves and lower legs, your feet and your toes. Relax all your toes.
feel the whole body breathe. Whole body at peace. Breath and mind flowing in the single stream. Feel that flow between your navel and your nostrils. As you feel the current of breath and prana flowing in that space, just listen. Listen for your personal mantra, for your favorite divine name, or so hum the sound of your breath. Hum the exhaling breath. So the inhaling breath. Feel that gentle song. Draw your mind more and more still. Feel that vibration draw you towards a chamber of silent presence. in this peaceful chamber as long as you like. Let that gentle song ripple on the surface of your calm mind. Let it merge in the flow of breath from head to toe. whole space inside becomes full of that sound.
keeping this awareness. In your mind and in your breath. Let your mind turn gently outwards. Feeling the solidity of your physical body. Let your palms come before your face. Your eyes gently open. Feeling the mantra reflected there. And gently let your mind move outwards again. Observing its motion. Let your heart fill your palms with fragrant blossom of gratitude. Offer that blossom for the well being of all creatures with a prayer of gratitude. the perennial rue who comes to us at each moment with every breath we take to bring us this peace. Om Shanti, Shanti. So there's just a very brief practice. There are more ways of refining each of the segments in that process of meditation. Sometimes people think of those segments as being steps in a sequential process. Each of those steps is a whole science of meditation all by itself. There's a whole system of meditation about feeling the space within. Hundreds of thousands of words written about the observation of breath. So everything in yoga, every detail in yoga has many, many refinements to it. And the secret of yoga is ultimately refining that awareness because when you do that, the advanced practices of yoga happen spontaneously as you enter those depths. Just refine your breath awareness. and Someday you'll be sitting there in your meditation and all of a sudden your breath will cease. And there will be no anxiety about ever taking another breath. And you have the experience of Kevala Kumbhaka without any effort. It just comes as a gift of grace. So, as my master said, just refine your breath awareness. All of this will come to you. I think that's probably a good place to pause and I think it's just about time to take some questions. So. Thank you, Stomaji. It was really wonderful and uh, I think what you mentioned in the beginning and what you also repeated a few times, the advancement of practice is through the ultimate refinement of the fundamental practices. I think extending it, it's also the refinement of fundamental concepts that you very clearly brought out and you explained it to us. Tapas generally has a, a very esoteric sense attached to it, something of the self-mortification nature, but just to know that it is the enjoyment through concentration or samadhi sometimes is always felt that something that is unreachable but to know that every aesthetic rapture can be a doorway to samadhi 
in fact we had a lovely session this afternoon on uh, the musical instruments and nada upasana we had some experiences and this session gave much more meaning to the experiences we had in the afternoon so oh, beautiful thank you very much for clearing these simple fundamental concepts and allowing us to access these insights and also understand these practices much better thank you very much very welcome uh, there are a few questions uh, maybe i'll share it with you but maybe before i take up this questions i'm also a little tempted to ask this because you have you have spent time with swami rama and swami veda bharati and you also mentioned about the experiences of biofeedback uh so there's also this book by elmer and alice green beyond biofeedback which right. brings out various experiments that were conducted on swami rama so can i request you to share a little more about these experiences and also in the context of yoga sutra which again you brought in about the vibhuti pada which uh, it seems to be a little inaccessible segment of the yoga sutra text we understand them by words but we may not be able to connect so much to the outcomes or the practices and also there is also a word of caution at the end of third chapter which says samad uh, vyuthane siddhaya samadhau uh, antaraya which is which can be obstacles in the state of samadhi but they could be siddhis uh, at a distracted state so just some light on this and well here's here's a wonderful example of where the words that patanjali uses are really important he doesn't call the third chapter of the yoga sutras siddhi pada right he calls it vibhuti pada vibhuti means varieties of being and this term vibhuti is about the maturation the the coming to fruition of normal human potentials those things that we think of as magical powers and mystical powers of yoga are are actually normal human capacities that ripen and mature as you deepen your practice they will make themselves known spontaneously if you just pursue deepening the the practice of meditation and that's why patanjali in the only sutra where he uses the word siddhi warns people about you know making an effort to learn these things for their own sake that's not the point at all these are just explanations of things that occur naturally in the process of meditation there's a really interesting uh researcher in california a guy named dean raden who's done a lot of of work on yoga and meditation and he published a book in 2013 that's just wonderful it's called super normal and his effort in that book was to try to show that the the siddhis so called siddhis of yoga are normal human potentials in everyone and that he he actually set out to try to show with research scientifically that these things are are present in everyone to a certain degree and he he succeeded what he did was he lumped together all of the different studies that have been done on things like clairvoyance clairaudience psychokinesis um all of these sort of you know so called miraculous powers and by lumping all these research studies together you get such a huge pool of subjects that any significant result cannot possibly be random and that's exactly what he saw he saw that these abilities were there even in people who don't meditate to a measurable degree very small but it's there and you can measure it and he also demonstrated that it increases with increasing experience in meditation you know so if you if you do your meditation practice you will gradually come to know these things in the vibhuti pada when your meditation has reached a sufficient depth and as as i was saying before a lot of these wonderful qualities of personality that we often approach as practices of yoga become second nature to you they become who you are as a person and any word of caution or advice while uh, encountering such a special manifestations or the mind would naturally be refined at that level you know these are gifts of grace one of the other important secrets of yoga um in the the i forget the number of the sutra the sutra where potentially is describing the fruits of the establishment of uh, 
uh, Astea, what he says is all treasures, uh, all treasures attend upon that person. And a lot of people think, oh, all treasures, I'm going to win the lottery, you know, or, or I'm going to you know, walk around and, and find money on the street, that sort of thing. Those treasures are the attention of the, of the disembodied siddhas. Those yogis watch your practice. You sit and feel like you're doing it all alone in your little meditation room, not possible. If you do a regular practice, then somebody is sitting with you. You won't know it. They don't make themselves known, only very rarely. But every once in a while, they give you a little gift. They, they let your meditation go a little deeper than you've ever gone before. And you feel those gifts of grace. Wonderful meditation, a depth that I never experienced before. And I think just keeping an attitude of gratitude towards those gifts is really important. And to understand that, you know, this is not me. This is not me doing this. <laughs> this is not mine. There's another interesting, interesting thing that all yogis understand is that whatever powers may come to them do not belong to them and they are not theirs to use for their own purposes. Those abilities come through them by way of the Shakti, but if they try and grab onto it, then they're going to suffer. <laughs> um, and uh, there are all kinds of, of hilarious stories about people you know, running afoul of that. But I think just keeping an, an attitude of gratitude about whatever comes to you in your meditation. And when these uh, advanced phenomena occur, just enjoy them. I mean, they're there mm -hmm. for your enjoyment and to, to um, intensify and increase the amount of joy that you carry in your mind. And if you're... If you're of, uh, go ahead. Uh, a situation in uh, Swami Vivekananda's life story uh, where he started to experience something like this and he meets uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa in the evening and Ramakrishna Paramahamsa has a very clear word. He says, Narain, have you started spending even before earning? And that Swami Vivekananda carried throughout his life. Very good. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's okay. Just fine. No, I think what the point that I was going to make is that if you really observe these things from buddhi, it's a very important point. If you remember your Sankhya metaphysics, buddhi is the cause of ahankara. If you dissolve your ahankara back into its cause by keeping your awareness grounded in buddhi, then as you enjoy your life episode by episode, you gradually break the attachment of ahankara to the experiences that you have because you're watching from a different level. Mm -hmm. And that automatically severs the self-identification with both the experiences and with the formation of sanskaras that create our karma. So this is, this is one of the important ways of gradually purifying the burden of karma that, that we bring from life to life. True. Thank you very much. Uh, I have you're a next so question from... Uh, Perikul, Perinkulam Ramanathan, who says, uh, Swami Hariharananda has a beautiful exploration of the sutra, explanation of the sutra 134, Prachardana Vidharana Abhyam. He talks about the tranquility of mind achieved through unification of exhalation and retention without any separate effort. I find this happening in Bahya Kumbhaka. Kindly explain further on this. I do appreciate your explanation of Prayatna Shaitilya, which I do emphasize in my Pranayama classes. So it's also complimented and also seeking explanation of Bahya Kumbhaka. The experience of Kumbhaka can happen either Antara or Bahya, internally or externally, of Kevala Kumbhaka. And, uh, um, and you're absolutely correct. Just enjoy those things when they occur, because this is the... This is the fruition of your practice of mindfulness, but it's also the opening of a door into the deeper states of meditation. So, you know, there's a, there are many meditation manuals, for example, that talk about focusing on the pause in the breath. Mm -hmm. Now, my guru was very clear about this. He said, eliminate that pause. 
smooth over that pause. He said, that pause is your death. Eliminate the pause and you decide when you leave your body. Um, I was at a workshop one time with a, a, it was actually a clinical hypnosis workshop, but the man leading the workshop was one of the senior teachers of Tibetan Mahamudra meditation in the United States, actually in the Western hemisphere. And he was talking about this process of observing the pause between exhalation and inhalation. So my hand went up and I asked him the question that, you know, in my tradition, we're taught to eliminate that pause. He said, don't do that. You know, the Buddhist psychologists have, have identified a meditation psychosis that comes from trying to eliminate that pause. So I was really confused at this point because both Swami Veda and Swami Rama are very emphatic on that point. And I thought about it all day. And finally, at the end of the day, the light went off in my mind that the difference is that um, the problematic and pathological nature of that pause comes from either unconscious breathing from shwasa and prashwasa as uh, um, potentially explains in sutra 30 sutras 29 to 31 um, so it either comes from ordinary respiration or from the effort involved in sahita kumbhaka so in our tradition swami rama would never allow anybody to practice sahita kumbhaka until they had already begun to experience Kevala Kumbhaka, because that was a symptom, a sign that their nadis were sufficiently purified to be able to, to, be able to do that. And so um, at that point, the cessation of breath becomes a joyful thing. That's when you concentrate on the pause in the breath. It's when the Kevala Kumbhaka comes and you stay in that space as long as you can. You know, as, as long as you have sanskaras, sooner or later you will come out of it. So you don't have to worry about not breathing because sooner or later you'll start breathing again. But you know, in, in his Path of Fire and Light, Swami Rama talks about processes of Kumbhaka that go on for eight hours, 12 hours, 20 hours. And you can't do that by holding your breath. It's not possible. You can only do that through the natural sensation of Kevala Kumbhaka. Hariharan Aranya is absolutely, well, in his scholarship on, on Yoga Sutras, Swami Veda uh, made it very clear to me that there are only three commentators that he considers to be authoritative in an experiential sense on the entire course of yoga. Uh, one okay. of them is one of them is Vyasa and his commentary. The other is Bhojaraja, the okay. 10th century Bhojabhati. great, yeah, great 10th, 10th century king who was a great patron of the arts and a great yogi besides and Aranya, who was a modern commentator from the 1930s. Um, and very often in his discussion of all of the different points of view of the different commentators, he will use Aranya's commentary to resolve all of these conflicts at the end of each discussion of the sutras. And so Swamiji always had a very great reverence for the work of Pariharanda Aranya, and actually maintained a conversation for some years with his chief disciple, Dharma Mega Aranya, after uh, Ariharana left the body. Okay. But even the very fact that he elevated them, the, all the three together, like Vyasa, Bhoja, and Harihar Aranya, it itself is a great uh, recognition. Thing. Yep. And it, it isn't that the other commentaries are not valuable. They raise really important points. But the other commentators weren't practitioners through the entire course of yoga. And the effort that Swami Veda made in his own commentary um, was to try to provide that experiential component. And, and he, did, he did so, I mean, the second volume is, is almost a thousand pages. We've revised his first volume, which will be coming out in print in the next couple of years. It's almost a thousand pages. We have the Vibhutipada, which is going to press soon, which is almost a thousand pages. So, so he, he did a good job of packing a great deal into those, into those books. So. Thank you. I, we would like to share the details of those books uh, with our uh, participants. So sure. if you could let us know where they can reach out to you, uh, we can just share it within the comment section, the chat section. Okay. 
I actually, uh, the um, volume one was published in 1986 in the first edition by the Himalayan Institute, and that's readily available just about anywhere. The revised edition will be published, uh, I'm not actually sure who the publisher is going to be, but it will be going to press soon. Um, second volume was published by Motila Banarsidas in Delhi, and uh, the third volume is, is going to press probably before volume one. So that should be out in the next 18, year to 18 months, I think. And that will, um, again, I'm not sure who the publisher is that they're gonna choose to do that with. Thank you. Uh, so that also brings to our next question by Sri Sunil Kumarji, who says, uh, having read and spent time with uh, Swami Rama and Swami Veda Bharati, would you like to share some experiences with them uh, and also some unique experiences that you might have had with both of them separately? Um, let's see. Well, the one that, the one that comes to mind is, is an example of this principle that, uh, you know, one's abilities that come, the abilities that come to you in yoga are not your own. Um, back in 2008, uh, Swami Rama and Swami Veda uh, gave me Adhikara to do Mantra Diksha in our tradition. And uh, uh, so I started doing initiations with people. And at one point I was in Hungary and had a very long day. And there were, I think there were 17 people. So it went from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon. Uh, and I, I gave the last two people the same mantra. Now, even Swami Veda, when he was learning to do initiations from Swami Rama, would often give a mantra to some people and then he'd start to doubt whether he had actually given the mantra that was coming from the lineage or something that was coming out of his own imagination. Okay. You know, as I often describe it, I know just enough about Sanskrit and mantras to be dangerous. Um, and so we want to be very, very careful that the only thing we're giving in the mantra initiation is what comes from the guru. So the moment that, uh, the moment that Swami Veda would begin to doubt, very often the person would get up off the seat and leave the room and he'd start doubting immediately. The phone would ring and Swami Rama would be on the phone saying, you think you give the mantras? I give the mantras. Boom. Um, now, for, unfortunately, I didn't have that available to me because Swami Rama left embodied life uh, before I began helping with this task. And so um, there was this long day in Hungary where I gave two people the same mantra. My mind started worrying about, about this and I started you know, thinking the critical voice that we all have in our mind started up in my mind saying, you know, you just did that because you were tired. You just wanted to get it over with, blah, 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 blah. So that was going on for a while. Uh, after a couple of weeks, I had a conversation with a, a woman who came up to greet me. And she said, two weeks ago, you initiated my daughter. She was the last person you initiated. So immediately I listened very carefully. She said, my daughter wanted, to, wanted me to tell you the following story. She was so excited to get a mantra. And the night before you gave her her initiation and her mantra, you came to her in her dream and gave her the same mantra you gave her the next morning. Now that's a beautiful story for her. It was also a message to me from my guru that said, you don't give the mantras, I give the mantras, stop worrying. Um, and so that's how communication between us tends to be these days. It's very indirect, it's very formless, um, and there's a certain feeling that comes with it that lets me know that this is, this is Baba looking in on things to make sure everything's going okay. Um, trying to think about the story about Swami Veda. He was certainly a very different person in the 1970s, he was a lot stricter teacher and he would put us through quite a few things that he relented on later in his life. In Minnesota, we have a lot of woods 
and outdoor spaces. And we used to go on these retreats where he would uh, have us meditate outside in the early morning by a river covered with mosquitoes for an hour and a half. And it was just so difficult. Um, he wouldn't have done that later in his life, I don't think. Um, you know, another, uh, another interesting thing about Swami Veda was uh, we accidentally discovered that he never left a state of yoga nidra even when he was away. He was doing some experimentation with Dean Radin in California. And Radin had hooked him up to an electroencephalogram to measure his brain waves. They were trying to replicate the, the experiment about Yoga Nidra that Swami Rama did with the Menninger Foundation. And before they started the experiment, Radin realized that he had left the machine running as they were talking. And he looked, and here Swami Veda was producing delta waves the whole time that they were talking with each other with his eyes open. Now, you ask a neurologist about this, they would say it's not possible. But that was the case for him. So we realized, Radin first realized, and then the rest of us understood that he probably was in a state of yoga nidra at all times, waking and sleeping, um, which, which again accounts for some of his ability to um, maintain, maintain his body and to be able to uh, continue to work the way that he did. He would come to, uh, he would come to the edge of a cardiac arrest literally every day. Very often in the middle of a lecture, he would be sitting there and all of a sudden he would just stop and he would say, give me a moment. And he would go inside and do three, four minutes of yoga nidra and then just carry on as if nothing would happen, had happened. And yet each time he could feel his heart beginning to stop. And he was able to arrest that process and come back each time uh, using his his abilities with Yoga Nidra. When he did his books, particularly the books on the Yoga Sutra, I really can't say that he wrote those books out of his own personality because he was, um, he was in sleep science, what we call a, he was an owl, a night person. He would do a lecture in the evening at eight. He would have his dinner about 10 o'clock and then he would start his work day about 11.30 or 12 and work through the night. And, uh, very often when he was writing, what this meant is that he would work with an assistant, he would lie down, go into yoga nidra, and he would begin to dictate. The person would, the assistant would take down the dictation and then we would, you know, type it out and format it the next day. So when he was writing in that way, he really was writing from the lineage rather than from his own personality. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think his, his commentary on yoga sutras is so extraordinary. They're all very big books. His language tends to be kind of complex uh, because he used to say, I'm not writing for an audience of readers. I'm writing to document a tradition. And so he was very careful about how he did that. So these books can be a little formidable to read. You know, I think if you want to study his Yoga Sutras writing, I would start with some easier books first, you know, Swami Satchidananda or Christopher Chapel, or uh, there's actually a wonderful little version of the Yoga Sutras with uh, Vyasa's commentary that was translated by a fellow named Bengali Baba. Uh, we don't think this was Swami Rama's guru, although the person who did this translation was definitely somebody with some accomplishment, for sure. It's, uh, it's Indian English from the early 20th century, which may be a little difficult for some readers, but it's very good. And the footnotes are you could just read the footnotes and it would be an interesting book. So. What's the title of that book? Just a... Uh, uh, and the I think, author it, I think it's, I think it's just called the Yoga Sutras with the commentary of Vyasa by Bengali okay. Baba. A very thin just, little book. You can get it as a, it's published by Motilal. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That would be helpful. Uh, so continuing with the line of questions, we have a question from a friend, I think Jacqueline from Singapore, who asks, you're speaking about detachment and as a way to Samadhi, developing that sense of space or detachment. And how can we who are immersed in the day-to-day -day normal living and not 
advanced practitioners in many ways. How can we have that glimpse of that experience? Carry your meditation with you. You know, take it off your seat and take it into the rest of your life by keeping your breath awareness all the time. Um, when we were staying in uh, the little ashram that Swami Veda started in Minneapolis in the early years, he would ask us all to maintain Jiva Mudra all the time, uh, folding the tongue, putting a, the tip of your tongue behind the upper teeth and then sliding your tongue back along the hard palate so that if you wanted to speak, you'd have to unfold your tongue first. It was a wonderful way to maintain a silent mind, but it was also a reminder to maintain the awareness of your breath during the day. And it worked, it worked very well. So if you carry your breath awareness with you, gradually you learn to experience your whole life from the perspective of buddhi. And if you do that, as I said before, that will dissolve the attachment that you have to your experiences. You just enjoy them. You just enjoy them. You don't grab onto them and try to repeat them and, you know, get all attached to having them all over again. You were mentioning in one of your earlier talks that Swami Veda Bharati did this like with all his advancement in other practices and all, yet awareness on breath is something that he did till the last moment of his life. Yes. He really, I mean, he really maintained his breath awareness at every moment. Um, and sometimes, especially in the last few years of his life, he would just be sitting there in his chair and he would go off into samadhi. You know, it would just come spontaneously and we would just wait until he came back, you know. Um, so his practice kind of would flow in and out of his everyday life. Hmm. He had a regular meditation time that he kept every day. He kept the appointment with the guru, but he also maintained his meditative awareness at a deep level outside his, his designated practice time. That's the beautiful thing about mindful awareness. If you really approach your sadhana from that perspective, there's no time that you're not in meditation. Every mm. part of your life becomes some kind of meditation. True. And also in this context, if I can ask, uh, you also refer to uh, the one of the sutras in the part of, in the series of Ekatattva Abhyasa. Mm -hmm. The Prachardhana Vidharana Abhyamba Pranasya. And you said, uh, Swami Bharati used to see how people interpret or explain that sutra. I find that whole section of Ekatattva Abhyasa very, very important section of the part of the first chapter. Right. Uh, can I request you for some light on that? Like, and why is it termed as Ekatattva Abhyasa and many different kinds of practices given under that broad title? Well, I think, I think enjoyment through concentration is really what Patanjali is talking about there. Mm -hmm. You know, the Ekatattva is, you know, whatever the essence of whatever it is you're experiencing at the moment really focused on that. Um, and I think the fact that it follows so closely on, on uh, Sutra 34 uh, is an indication that, that uh, in a way, the Eka Tattva that he's talking about is mindful awareness in general. Mm. Um, you know, that, that cultivating that attitude of mindful awareness at all times is, is one of the shortcuts to Samadhi. Okay. So we have a connected question here from uh, Harshaji who is asking, uh, what is your opinion about using various substances like psilocybin, uh, which will help you to reach those states of higher consciousness? People always want to have the experience, you know? They're very impatient. People, we're all very impatient, right? It takes time. It took Buddha 500 lifetimes to get enlightened. So why do we worry that it takes a few years of practice to do this? My, my problem with the substances is that um, you're dependent on them. You're dependent on something external. You know, cultivate the ability to bring that experience from within. The substance is not likely to help, it, help you to do that. It will give you a taste. 
But until you actually have the experience in meditation, you can never really tell whether it's the same experience that you had with the substance. So I'm, I'm not very enthusiastic about those. I have a number of students who are interested in pursuing it. And I try, I try not to be too discouraging, but not too encouraging with them about, about it. That whole area though, of, of those substances, you know, psilocybin and, and some of the uh, LSD derivatives, is, is an area that finally is beginning to become, come again under some neuroscientific scrutiny. And I think we will learn some really interesting things about those substances in the, in the next couple of decades. And, and one of them, ketamine, is on the verge of being approved as an antidepressant medication in a lot of places at this point, uh, certainly in the US and Europe. Um, and it is, it is actually quite an amazing antidepressant because where most antidepressants uh, take two, three weeks for people to feel some effect from them, ketamine is immediate. Mm. True. It's, it's very interesting that way. So, I mean, it's not that these substances don't have value. I'm not sure that there are really valuable guides to meditation. You know, be patient, do the sadhana, go deep. Enjoy the journey. You know, you don't have to get to the, you don't have to rush to get to the destination. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like learning to enjoy taking the train in India instead of flying everywhere all the time. You know? It's a beautiful trip. True. Just uh, since you mentioned about journey, I am reminded of a workshop that we had in UK a few years ago on consciousness and where one of the presenters who has been working with these substances and the meditative states that induces for nearly 40 years, he was mentioning that this is something like taking a helicopter drive. You go to a place, have an overview, but you come back soon. You won't have an experience of getting down and being in that place. So that's all the different difference yeah. between what meditation can do and what substances can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have, know, go and get a glimpse, but don't make a habit of it. <laughs> I think that's the dangerous part. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I'll take the last question and with that. You know, I, one, one more thing about that whole question. You know, there's this story about Neem Karoli Baba and Ramdas because all those, those people who came with Ramdas were all a bunch of hippies just like me uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And one day Maharaj came to... Uh, Ramdas and, and said, what is all this stuff with LSD? I want to try this. And so Ramdas brought him some hundreds of doses of LSD and he took okay. them all. And Ramdas okay. was horrified him and he thought, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And after, after a couple of hours, Maharaj, Maharaji came back to uh, Ramdas and he said, you know those pills I took a while ago? I have a little headache. <laughs> So to someone who's really established in that state of consciousness, the chemicals are nothing. True. So you actually mentioned it. That was my last question. How did your journey begin in the uh, field of yoga? I, in, in my middle school years, reading about meditation and about Indian religion, started this little curiosity in my mind. And I can recall saying to myself at the time, you really should learn some more about this at some point. And uh, it was only a few years later, actually, that uh, Swami Veda came to give a lecture at my high school about meditation. And once I heard that lecture and once I met him, that was that. And I had no, I had no idea at the time how that would change my life Recently, I had the opportunity actually to thank the teacher who let me know that that lecture was going to happen. He's still alive and uh, we still communicate a little bit over Facebook, even though he no longer lives in the area. And uh, I had a chance to uh, send him a copy of my book just as, a, as a, uh, an expression of gratitude for what he did for my life by introducing me to him because it changed everything. I'm being a very, I'm being a very poor That's marketer. So I should, amazing. Yeah. I should probably let people know that I, I wrote a book on the process of emotional purification in yoga. 
Um, the title is Clearing the Path. The Yoga Way to a okay. Clear and Pleasant Mind. And it's published both in India and also in the U.S. And for people clearing who might be path. listening. Clearing the path, yes. Okay. For people who might be listening in Hungary, there is also a Hungarian translation of it. Hmm. But this is so amazing. Just one chance encounter. You attend a talk and it changes the whole course of life. Well, you know, you hear these stories all the time. I can't True. tell you how many times I've heard people say, I was walking through the bookstore and this book, Living with the Himalayan Masters, fell off the shelf into my hands. You know? <laughs> Stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's just really interesting how, how the events of life activate those sanskaras of whatever pri pre previous meditation practice you may have done and get them, get them active again. I mean, since we can't see the link, we call it as a coincidence or accidental. But the, the divine hand which moves all these things is something one cannot be, uh, one cannot show enough gratitude to it. There's no it accident. never be enough. No accident. I, you know, I heard, I, Swami Veda, when he was uh, interested in finding a guru, went to the Kumbh Mela in Allahabad in 1952. He asked everybody he could find, who should I, who should I seek? And everybody said, oh, you have to meet the Swami Rama who's just come out of the mountains. And so he searched for Swami Rama for 17 years, chased him all over India, never found him. Hmm. Finally, he ended up being sent to a community of, uh, of Arya Samajis in South America to serve as their pundit. And at that point, he kind of gave up on ever finding a guru. He was very, very despairing at that point in his life. So he said, I might as well just get married and be a professor and I guess that's it for this life. So he got married, started a family, got his European degrees in Sanskrit and uh, was asked to take this professorship in Minnesota. One day a graduate student comes to him and says, you know, there's this Swami in a hotel downtown giving lectures on yoga. Maybe we should go. Okay. And Swamiji said, oh, I'm Honestly, I know more than most swamis. I'm not very interested. But his wife said, you know, it's Deepavali. We should make some food and go and help him feel at home. And Swamiji understood that he was not going to defeat that argument. So he went. And he, on the way in the car, he composed this, this very elaborate verse of greeting in Sanskrit to test him. And so they met, he gave his verse from a very specific period in Sanskrit literature. The Swami responded with a verse from the same period. So he thought, okay, this, per this person might know something. And they came back to his hotel room every night for about three weeks. Now the interesting thing here, no names were ever exchanged. Uh, it was one time. time. And it was three weeks later that it finally began to dawn on this in his mind could this be the same Swami Rama I was chasing all over India? And he went and he asked and he, he said, is your name Swami Rama? He said, yes. <laughs> so he said, why did you wait so long? Oh, wow. He said, oh, with your karma? You know, so even Swami Veda had a certain burden of sanskaras that he had to mm. clarify and purify before he was ready to be taught. And I heard that story for years you know, and thought it was a wonderful story. It's such a lovely story. Well, it didn't dawn on me for okay. 25 years that Swami Rama also came from the caves of the Himalayas to find me. The thought didn't mm -hmm. even occur to me for 25 years. That's how long it took for me to really become a disciple. Hmm. So that's why I say, you know, be patient with yourself and understand that they really do come when you're ready. And before that time, they're watching you anyway. You know, if you're not being watched by any particular guru, you're being watched by the community of siddhas. So it's always available to you. Hmm. I think these words were highly reassuring to know that uh, there's someone who is there. I mean, I may not be able to see them, connect with them at the moment, but someone who is watching and will be there at the right moment. 
thank you so much dr parker and soma ji for this lovely lovely session and taking us through a beautiful journey yeah, thank you very welcome. much i hope you enjoyed as much as i did very much i think all our participants are also sharing their compliments and their just profusely uh, profusely thanking you for what you have offered them today thank and you my, very much and my thanks to everybody for their kind attention you know it's one thing to teach and give lectures but what's important to me is the relationship i have with the people in front of me which mm. is a little different when you're doing it on zoom but i can still feel that true and if i don't if i don't feel that nothing will flow and it'll be terrible true you know? so you know the attention of the audience is is really a part of the relationship and it's a it's a vital part so thank you all for for paying such kind attention definitely so much like uh, we had about uh, 130 people who had joined us on zoom and about 20 people on facebook and they have been continuing like even now we see that many watching and connecting i think this is the beauty Wonderful. of the connection that has been brought about yeah. here yeah yeah so uh, to conclude i would request for a message for sadhana a guidance a tip that you would like to share with uh, all the participants uh, finally before we end the session but before that i would like to uh, announce the programs for the day with your for next day with your permission Yeah. Shrinivas oh, yeah. can I request you to kindly show us the programs for tomorrow? Oh Subhash, wonderful. Yes. So tomorrow we have in the morning session a uh, Dr. Ramchandra Bhatt ji who is the founder of Veda Vigyana Gurukulam Veda Vigyana Shodh Samsthanam a gurukulam where I studied and also the teacher my Sanskrit teacher in my high school to whom I was referring to he was the one who inspired us to read the living with himalayan masters but oh, with yes. a word of caution please don't read it <laughs> so he will be Very there good. speaking on the importance of guru purnima tomorrow morning because tomorrow is guru purnima and he'll be speaking about the guru parampara that's between 7 to 8 am indian standard time and in the afternoon session between 11:30 to 12:30 we have saraswati vasudevan ji who is the founder of yoga vahini chennai it's one of the well known institutes in the tradition of krishna macharya yoga teaching and uh, she will be speaking on essence of yoga therapy and in the evening we have yet another uh, highly learned scholar sri dr subhash kak who will be speaking on yoga and science of consciousness so it it is yet another promising day of wonderful speakers who have great insights in what they are speaking what they are sharing so i request all of you to join us tomorrow once again and before i uh, get back to stoma ji with my request i would like to say as some people have been asking all these sessions are being recorded and they will be available for free on uh, indica yoga youtube channel and also indica yoga website so kindly make use of this we have about 100 speakers coming on in this entire festival and each one is a gem and uh, what they are sharing is very very precious so kindly connect with us stay connected and let's make the best of what universe is providing us in the form and during the time of lockdown i i know subhash and uh, the wonderful speaker and get him to read some poems okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you for hinting it <laughs> um the message that i want to leave you with is the message that i started with that very simple injunction from my gurudev just refine your breath awareness all of this will come to you mm. all of this will come to you thank you very much stoma ji gratitude and thanks to all our participants thanks for joining okay so this will be the events for tomorrow good night or good morning or good day wherever you are namaste shubh ratri <laughs>